Hi folks, okay, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the Indian tulwa, okay? So it's the, the famous curved sword of, of India, um, also popular in neighbouring regions such as Nepal and Afghanistan, um, and what's now um, Pakistan and Kashmir and so on. Um, so essentially it's a sabre blade. Um, it doesn't differ an awful lot from European sabres in the blade. In actual fact, uh, many of them used Euro European blades. Uh, they bought German blades in from Solingen in the 18th century and in the 19th century they often used old British cavalry blades, the old Napoleonic 1796 sabre blades, uh, reshaped them a little bit, sharpened them up well and mounted them on a tulwar hilt. What I really want to talk about is the tulwar hilt because um, it's a little bit misunderstood but the 19th century sources um, uh, which are given in D.A. Kingsley's book, Swordsman of the British Empire, actually tell us all we need to know about this hilt. Okay, so the first thing to note is it's quite short compared to European hilts. Second thing to note is they always have this quite simple cross guard. Sometimes they have a knuckle bow added, but that doesn't really change the way you hold it. So, and this section at the middle of the cross guard is quite important, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Next thing to note is they often have this swelling in the centre, this kind of bulbous bit. And the last and most important thing is they have a great big disc at the, at the pommel, at the back end of the sword. Okay, so the first thing we'll talk about is the, is the guard. Um, it's got these very flat bits either side, and that's very similar to a Middle Eastern sword, like a, like a, a, a shamshir or a kilik, for example. Um, and what that means is when you hold the sword, your thumb rests very nicely flatly against the side and helps align the edge. Okay? So it's very easy to keep the edge aligned with this type of sword because you can actually feel the direction that your edge is pointing in with your, with your thumb, with the side of the thumb. And in that sense it's similar to a medieval European sword or a messer, for example. Um, next thing is this sort of bulbous bit in the centre of the grip. Now, not all tulwars are as uh, marked as this example is. Some are a bit more smooth and gentle, but they all swell in the middle. And that fills the palm of your hand very, very nicely. Uh, it, it just uh, makes for a very, very secure grip. But lastly, the most important part is this disc. Okay, so a lot of uh, writers have said that um, essentially the Indian grip represents the fact that Indian people in the 18th and 19th century were small, or had small hands. Well, to a certain extent there's maybe a little bit of truth in that, in that everybody in most places in the 18th and 19th century were on average a bit smaller than we are today, because they were not as well nourished and didn't have such good medical care. But, that's sort of missing the point of of why that disc is there. Um, the disc is actually there to enforce or encourage you to hold the sword in a, in a certain way. So we've already talked about how the thumb goes in flat against the side to keep the edge aligned. Now that disc means that when you cut, if you extend the blade forward, that disc now sticks into the back of the hand quite uncomfortably. So you don't want to do that. Instead, when you cut, you keep an angle that's close to 90 degrees, maybe a little bit more open like that, but not as far forward as a European sabre grip would be, for example. Close angle to here, such that when you strike the target, you're drawing the edge across the target. Okay? And what that does is it means you're pulling a large portion of this curved blade across what you're cutting and inflicting a very, very deep uh, and long wound that's far more likely to remove parts of the person's body or disable them and cause huge amounts of blood loss of course. So this disc tells you a lot about the way that this sword is supposed to be used and that is with these long sweeping drawing cuts. Now what's worth mentioning is that those long drawing cuts do not have as much range as the European style cut extending the blade out does. Um, so you have to get closer to the opponent to inflict these massive wounds. So in that sense, the European way of cutting has an advantage of reach, but it does less damage when it hits the target. Um, and in Indian swordsmanship, they traditionally used either a buckler or a large shield. And that, of course, enables you to get more naturally close into the opponent to administer these great big sweeping uh, drawing cuts. Um, and it should be mentioned, on horseback, they also did a drawing cut that was done as a push. 
Much like we would uh, have done in European swordsmanship, a thrust from horseback, they did the same motion, but they applied it with the edge. So the edge slid into the target and off as you went past on your horse. Um, and there's accounts in D.A. Kinsley's book of people having their heads taken clean off uh, in this fashion as someone rode past and just laid the edge across the target as it slid across. And you keep that angle with the wrist there. Um, so there we go. Um, the disc on a, on a tulwa is very important and it essentially teaches you how to use the weapon. Final thought, there were similar training methods for the drawing cut in uh, Turkish sources and Persian sources and one of them describes actually placing your knee against a, a wall or tree and then practicing the drawing cuts in such a way that you don't touch the object that you're resting your knee against. So it's something to try at home. Um, take care and think about getting a tool because they're good fun. Cheers.